Fifty years have passed since law enforcement officers opened fire on the campus of South Carolina State College, killing three unarmed students and wounding nearly 30 others. The shootings followed several days of student demonstrations, protesting continued segregation at Orangeburg's All-Star Bowling Alley. Despite a student police confrontation just two days before, no one anticipated the quelling events of February 8, 1968. Now, despite the passage of time, the specter of the Orangeburg Massacre still haunts us. Conflicting accounts of what happened persist, and numerous questions remain. Beneath the surface for many, the wound still festers. Please join me, my studio guests, and others still grappling with this painful legacy as we engage in a frank discussion of the Orangeburg Massacre, Remembrances and Reckoning. Police ride, they shot at random, they used double odd buck shots, and they they just never, there was never any remorse on the part of the people who actually participated in it. Um, then there were those who believed in justice in South Carolina, and there was no justice. I still miss him. I never did get the chance to see who he was going to be. So it's important in our, our family to keep his memory alive. Outside adjective, this has always been uh, the cry. I mean, you know, um, if people don't have enough sense to know that they're being treated unfairly. The fact of the matter is, our history is replete with agitation, replete with protest. Thank you for joining us. Please welcome now my studio guests who include retired SLED Lieutenant Carl Pete Stokes, who is present the night of February 8th. Next to him is Jack Bass, a former journalist and distinguished author and co-author of the book, The Orangeburg Massacre. Then we have retired Lieutenant Colonel Jordan Simmons, who was among the students shot that fateful February night. CNN analyst, attorney, and former South Carolina State Representative Bakari Sellers. And finally, we have Bill Barley, the uh, official photographer for the Office of Governor McNair that night and who was also reporting back to the governor. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Why is it the sentiment persists that the Orangeburg Massacre story is not complete? that we still have holes to fill in and questions to answer. To well, I, I think that there are a few reasons why. Um, I think mm -hmm. the first reason is that the state of South Carolina, um, it's our secret. Uh, you know, I, I oftentimes say that the, the soil of, of my great state is stained red with blood. And I don't think that there is any impetus or will to go back and revisit what was a very difficult moment emotionally, um, physically, um, mentally and politically for a lot of individuals. Um, and I think it's quite simple. Um, all eight, nine officers who fired shots into the group of students were tried um, in that Florence County Courthouse and they were all found not guilty. Uh, the only person who still bears the brunt of the blame is my father. And so uh, when you have three individuals, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton who were killed and you have another, uh, as my father says, 40, as you probably will say, close to 40 injured. I think the history books write 28 or 29. Um, and you still only blame one individual, then that story is incomplete. What occurred that night, the FBI took control of all of that and they did an investigation. But they have never, as far as I know, they have never released the results of their investigation. I was there. And I can, I can give you a whole, whole lot of exactly what caused what. And uh, I agree, uh, Jack's book did not tell it all, uh, but there's an awful lot there that needs to be told about civil rights in South Carolina. 
and how we at SLED and Governor McNair's office tried to keep from anything happening. And then I went down to Orangeburg on that Monday night, or that Monday afternoon, to do what we had did previously with other civil rights demonstrations to set up what we were going to do that night or Tuesday night. And uh, we expected to go to the bowling alley on Tuesday night, and they were going to let three students go in the, in, the, in the bowling alley, and we were going to arrest them and put them in court. But that's not what happened. That Tuesday night is when Makari's daddy, uh, I did not know him at the time, but there were about 60 to 70 students in the parking lot outside the bowling alley, milling around, talking with us and all that. But, but Cleveland Sellers agitated each group whenever they would talk to the police to, to the extent that they, they, they then began to cuss us after he would talk with them. But that went on, that went on for a couple of hours until one of the students went up to the door of the bowling alley and busted that window in, and that's what caused the riot right there, and everything went broke loose. And at that point, I think you have just unleashed where we talk about some of the inconsistencies and in what is considered the story of the Orangeburg Massacre. Okay, I, I would like to comment on one thing, though, in Cleveland Sellers that night was actually in Columbia. He wasn't even there. At, at a bowling, in Columbia at some event, and heard about it and came back, and then he went to one group that was shouting, and they stopped and told him what was going on, and he went to the next group, and the first group started shouting. Then he went to the second group. When he left them, they started shouting, and I think there was a lot of con confusion about that. This, it's true they started shouting, after he left, but they were shouting before he arrived. Jordan? I, I believe that if you were to <clears throat> ask students, history students, about the Boston Massacre on Boston Common, what happened, and you would probably get differing, differing opinions, although we know what was written. <clears throat> uh, and if you fast forward and you think about what happened in 1968? Um, if we were, to, we were, if we could bring all of those students back that were shot, and I think we did some of that. Jack did did a lot of that. Some of it was done in Florence. You are going to get different opinions from mm -hmm. within the group itself. Part of the problem, I believe, is revisionist history, and it it. It happened almost immediately. There were different, different, differing opinions on <clears throat> what happened that night within minutes after it happened. Well, I want to go back to the bowling alley incident, which uh, Lieutenant Stokes mentioned first, because that happened on February 6th. And what you said then was what became the rallying cry in explaining the Orangeburg massacre uh, Cleveland Sellers was agitated. Cleveland Sellers is the only person who has, was actually tried and convicted of well, something. For, for what occurred that night? Of something Not connected night, with the Orangeburg Massacre. His Tuesday indictment night. was backdated from February 8th to February 6th <laughs> after he was originally arrested for the events on February 8th because they could not find any evidence. They actually testified that my father stood on top of a fire truck, lit a bick and said, burn, baby, burn. I didn't see that. that. That we did know not that happen. Didn't happen. No. No. But that was part of the testimony. <laughs> Correct. I want to pause for a moment and let Cleveland Sellers speak for himself. I came uh, from Atlanta in November with the idea of enrolling at South Carolina State College. I had uh, withdrawn from Howard University back in 1964 when I went to Mississippi for the Mississippi Summer Project. And I never completed uh, my college cycle. So I came back there to uh, get involved with uh, um, uh, completing my uh, curriculum at South Carolina State College. We must know that the outside agitator mantra doesn't, doesn't fit me very well. I kind of grew up um, in a in a, a, a fairly middle class for black folk, 
uh, community. And so associates over in Orangeburg were associates in Denmark and Charleston, and we all kind of knew each other. So I'd spend as much time at South Carolina State as I would spend at both of the campuses there at, uh, at, in Denmark, South Carolina. So that's why I was there. I was there because I was gonna become a student at South Carolina State. Um, and, and in eight seconds, that changed every dynamic in my life completely, changed it. Orangeburg caused me to have um, uh, the FBI surveillance that went on from 1968, uh, probably up until about the 80s. And then it was less surveillance, but it was that. My, <clears throat> my FBI file is about that thick, and those are pages. And uh, it's very interesting on what they have in there. My uh, Mississippi Sovereignty Commission file is about yay thick. It's a little thinner. But that there was an effort made because they saw me as a, as a rabble rouser. I call myself a community organizer. I worked extremely well with students, but I also worked good with sharecroppers and, and cotton pickers and bean pickers and all those kinds of things that I had a very good rapport and I communicated. I was never a spokesman for civil rights. I never got up and, and, and gave a speech to a group to get them motivated and uplifted in order for them to go out and do a demonstration. What does it really mean for Cleve Sellers to have been fingered as the major culprit for this event? And why did the idea of him being an outside agitator persist? As I told you, early 60s, uh, we were beginning to have civil rights demonstrations. And uh, I would be at home, sleep, three o'clock in the morning, get a phone call from Chief Strong and said, pick me up. And I'd go pick him up. Now, this occurred on numerous occasions, uh, several, several different times during the year. And uh, but we would go down to Bamberg or, or uh, Denmark or uh, Orangeburg. We would go to the city at, like I say, three o'clock in the morning, and we would go to the cemetery. And we would pull into the cemetery and there, my headlights would hit on five or six black men. And Chief said, stop here. So I stopped. He said, I'll be back in a minute. He'd get out. He would go to talk to those uh, who were there. Then he'd come back 15, 20 minutes. We would head back to Columbia. And he said, we're going to have a demonstration in whatever town it would be at that time. And we're going to arrest 10, 12 students and put them in jail. That's what we did every time that we had knew of a demonstration. And we knew that Orangeburg was going to be tested. So we came down on Monday to meet with the group of uh, black men who would con control the group. And that's what our plan was, that there would be three of them that went into the bowling alley uh, and we would arrest them and put them in court like we had in all the other demonstrations in South Carolina. But that did not occur because the students gathered there in the parking lot, but none of them went, went in. And they were, like I would say, they were, they were agitated. They were, some talked pleasant with us, but then whenever Cleveland Sellers would talk with them, they would get boisterous at that time. I'm gonna stop you again, because here, um, what you have indicated is that there was a group of blacks, whom I assume you are thinking are the leadership, of, of the black community who were complicit in meeting with SLED or law enforcement they, they, they whenever wanted, there was some type of demonstration. They wanted us to be present whenever they demonstrated so that nothing would happen. And that's what we, we, would, we would plan to have X numbers of police officers, highway patrol to, there to make sure that they didn't get hurt. Is it possible that on the night of February 6th, the persons that you met with were not the people who were orchestrating this particular demonstration. The, person, the, the, the people we met with on Monday, 
I came down on, we came down on Monday, Chief Strom and, and you know, Lieutenant Gasquin and myself came down on Monday to meet, to set that up. And that's what we set up with, with the, the, the blacks that were, were in charge at that time, who were not students, but they were controlling everything. And so, uh, and, and, and we did not, I did not see any of those that night whenever we were on, on the 6th. George? I have a question. Uh, uh, Carl, you, you, you continue to say we met with a group of blacks yeah. and they were not there. Without giving names, I, I, I really don't understand that, that point that you're making because it sounds to me that you, had, you were using blacks as undercover agents. No, no. Well, I, I'm, I'm a little confused. What was the intent? It, I think I think he's talking about meeting with John Stroman and several of the others who had been Stroman had been a well, league at, bowler. At, at one meeting, at, I, I, I don't remember Stroman. names, but at one meeting, Ida Quince and Newman was at it. Okay. 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 I, and, I thought and, that's and, where he and, was. And at the, he, each he time was. we had a, a demonstration, there was a different group of people I, heading up. I that got town. what you're saying now. What you're saying is these were not students. These were. That's right. Leaders in the black community in the throughout community. South Carolina. That's correct. Okay, I, 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 they I, I wanted, see where you they are wanted, now. They wanted sleds of sh uh, uh, help and keeping them from getting hurt. I, and I, we were there. That, that's what our right. whole intent during those years was to make sure nothing happened until okay. Orangeburg. Well, I see disagreement going on that point as well. That's, that's, highway Patrol were not in second control. Chief Strong was in charge of every demonstration that went on. Chief Strom, would, we, we would set up for the highway patrol to come in and we would tell them what to do and how to patrol. All right. right. Why did Orangeburg go awry? Beginning with that night of the 6th, you said that the people that you met with were not there. Could it be that you didn't meet with the people who literally were orchestrating that particular demonstration? Since, by all accounts, the students actually were in charge of that one, not the official organization. Well, we weren't sure who was in charge that night. You we went down after the meeting on Monday, we went back to Columbia and we came back on Tuesday expecting what occurred in all the other civil rights demonstrations all over the state. We were expecting that to happen, what we set up with the, the, the leaders of the black community then. And, uh, and but, that is not what happened. The person that, and I did not know him at the time, it was uh, 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 after all of this was over that I found out who the person was that was going to one and agitating them, and that was Cleveland Sellers. And, uh, and then whenever, whenever the, the plate glass window was busted out, that's when, excuse my experience, but, but that's when all hell broke loose because they started throwing brick bats and, and busting windows and running back to the campus, hitting cars and everything else all the way back to campus. I'm going to allow another uh, account of that by one of the students who actually was there and who was beaten at this time. And then I want to talk a little more specifically about what the law enforcement response engendered and what it meant. Initially, I was at the front of the line when we went down to negotiate. And when we looked, I guess the word just had passed around um, on campus that something was going down at the bowling alley. And uh, I later hear that Stroman had, had even asked some student supporters to come down and th so, so the parking lot was just full. Um, we were at the front, you know, thinking that we could negotiate with the owner. And um, I've heard a lot of misrepresentation about what really happened because I was right there when that, when that window broke. Um, there was a student, I mean, the, the press of the crowd pushed that student against that window, and that's what broke that window. There, was, there were no bricks thrown, but the press of the crowd uh, caused that student, I mean, it, I remember him just looking around like, what, what has happened? You know, and that's when, uh, 
and we didn't know all that was happening. I've heard uh, different things about what happened in the back. You know, some reports say the students were taunting uh, the fire trucks, but in my estimation, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. I mean, but uh, I think fear brought them there, and uh, they just started beating, beating students, and. Um, everybody just started running for their lives. And, and those of us that were at the front of the line, we were then at the back of the line. So we were kind of like helpless. And some of us women were beaten. And uh, personally, I was beaten uh, by um, two uh, officers who had no reason to, I mean, I was helpless. It was like they were trying to teach us a lesson. To your knowledge, was Cleve the instigator? Au contraire. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, um, Cleveland um, was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. <laughs> and he had experiences with, um, you know, student protests. but. His role, as I remember, was to keep us calm and focused and directed and take away our naivete because he actually had had experiences with these type of situations. So I remember him, you know, always cautioning us. He was nothing but a gentle soul trying to uh, help us stay calm. As we look back on these events some 50 years later and hear the continued conflicting reports of what happened, even by eyewitnesses who were there, we're hard pressed to understand several things uh, that went on and we may never know what the resolution is. However, you talk about having called in uh, the additional law enforcement officers. One of the questions that stands out in everyone's mind is why the officers were equipped with heavy duty ammunition. They weren't e equipped with any different ammunition than they carry every day. So they always have this double lot buckshot in the, with in them. Their, in, their, in their cars, they did not necessarily use their shotguns out in the open, but they had them in the cars and they could get to them. In confronting students then, why would that be the choice of? We did not have, they did not have any on Tuesday night when this. No, 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 okay. on Thursday. Okay, on Thursday. Uh, well, you, you got, got to know what happened on Wednesday because we had to have curfews to, in order to stop the traffic from going in front and being bombarded by the students on campus. So we put checkpoints up all around the, around the campus there. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I was, Gasquin and I were checking a checkpoint right down from Claflin College, and uh, somebody from over there threw a cue ball, a b billiard ball at us. It hit right by side of us. And we also heard some shooting going on at that type, which was Wednesday night from campus up there, either Cleveland, uh, uh, Claflin or or South Carolina State, one or the other. Don't, Wasn't what, that a group of white kids in a car that mysteriously ended up on campus no. and ended up at a dead end and fired shots? No, no. There so was, who there fired? Was, That's there the first time I've car. heard anything about that, but I was, I was standing there whenever I heard the shots come from the campus itself, and that's when we had a SLED agent and a FBI agent over by the de depot, which was a wooden little building across the road, and they said, somebody shooting over here at us is hitting the building. And so uh, we knew that the building had been shot. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, in all of your investigation, investigations, did you ever come across any of the law enforcement officials that were injured by gunshots? No. No. Um, a lot of those, those students, myself included, grew up around guns. We hunt, and we knew how to shoot. I knew how to shoot a gun, a weapon, before I went in the Army. And I'm just thinking to myself, um, because I heard this years ago, 
they may have been, someone may have been shooting, but I don't think that they were shooting at the po policemen, the law enforcement, well, the if officers, they were shooting. The officers over at the depot thought they were shooting at them because the bullets were hitting mm -hmm. the building and uh, my primary duties at SLED at that time, I was a forensics expert. So we got up there and we, and we saw, um, I don't remember now, eight or 10 different places where bullets were. But now those were bullets from the preceding night. That this was is not from the night crazy. of February we, 8th. Well, we, we, we don't know anything about the 8th. No, I think it was. This is on, I think it this was, was on February. The, this was, was on the sixth. This was on the sixth. That I, I'm talking about that Wednesday night, rather the uh, seventh. Seven. This was on Wednesday night that I'm talking about that our officers were there being thought they were being shot at. That was on Wednesday night. And those bullets that were dug out were overhead on this depot. Jordan's question, however, um, brings to mind the fact that. With all of the evidence afterwards, there was never any indication of bullets on the night of February 8th. But look, can we just one second talk about the fact that there were white kids on campus on the 7th who fired shots? I mean, yes. Jack, wait, it, am I making it, that up, Jack Bass? Yeah. I don't, as far I don't, as I know, you're mm -hmm. making it up. Yeah. But the question that he raised was, and we have heard it reported, that one of the incidents that we know little about is the idea that these two whites in a car did interstate college campus. That, I think what that was on Wednesday night. Is that an incident with which you are familiar? Yes, yes. They, they went in and, and were firing some pistols or 22s or something, and, uh, and they got into a dead end, and students then started throwing stuff at them, and they came off the campus and turned right onto the highway when they got there. And the uh, one... I think it was a campus policeman actually pulled them over. And I think they got arrested, but I don't mind remembrance is there was never any actual trial. Um, so that was one of the things that was sort of just helping build up tension. And that's also one of the, ins the reasons that we continue to talk about the incompleteness of the story. When we sit here and we hear about <coughs> the agitation from the students, but we don't hear anything about things that may have happened well, we hear otherwise. this we <clears throat> hear this but we had those streets blocked off how anybody could drive up white black or whatever and drive on campus we would have known that and that did not happen we had the, we had it blocked off i, I don't care what anybody says the, 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 they were not that that's the first i've heard about any white students being on campus shooting People don't know it, but a pickup truck drove on the campus uh, earlier and it scared us to death. As far as I know to this day, there's never been a, a report of that. That has never been put into the, uh, the records of what happened at Orangeburg. And then later on that night, uh, students used to, um, used to, um, um, what is it? They used to go down to the, across the tracks, but down to a restaurant that was open. They get a bologna burger or a hamburger or something. And three of the students, I think it was either three or four of them, and they might have been all from Claflin, cut through the backyard of a white uh, um, citizen who lived right next to the campus. And when they cut through the yard, he went out and he heard them and he shot them with a bird shot. So you already had the introduction that the, um, that the, um, the police were using as cover to justify what they were planning to do. I think the discussion here is pointing up more and more the, re the inconsistencies in the reporting and the inconsistencies in recollections, the inconsistencies in what has actually gone down as being the incidents and activities of that night. The big thing was, and was that 
when students were, were out there and there were a few were throwing things into the street and, and if cars passed, there was a lot of frustration on campus. And, and somebody threw uh, uh, some sort of a, a large, it was a large stick, I think it was framed from a banister rail. Rail, banister rail. And it hit a highway patrolman right in the face as he looked up. And that created a lot of tension. This was the highway patrol now, not SLED. And this was the group that was specially trained by the FBI, and, and they, were turned, they were also told, if you believe your life or a fellow officer's life is in danger, fire a weapon. Now, every crowd control manual at that time, the FBI, National Guard, and Army said nobody fires a weapon unless a senior officer gives a command. Jack, you're making that up. I'm That's not, not true. That's I'm not, not making true. it up. Well, I'm telling you now, I was there, and I know when we moved forward, the students were sit sitting on that knoll, and they built a fire in the street. They did. And the, and the part, fire was built up, and then we were down there at Ch Point Charlie, as you say, and Chief Strom said, we've got to put that fire out. And so we called for the highway, for the uh, uh, fire department, fire department. To come up, and we moved forward w with the uh, highway patrol, with the uh, fire department to put the, put the uh, fire out. That's when the, 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 the uh, highway patrol moved with us at that time. Uh, the officer had already been hit with the, with the, with the uh, uh, banister. banister. And he had, we, he had been taken away. Uh, so we moved forward, and that's when, 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 when we moved forward, the, the uh, students moved back from the Manole, uh, 50 yards, something like that. And uh, uh, the highway patrol then took, took uh, position along the, the, highway, the uh, sidewalk and the, and the knoll while the, uh, officer, while the uh, firemen put the fire out. And uh, I was standing on, there was, three or four steps, I think, going up on the knoll. Uh, I was standing on top of that knoll whenever everything broke loose. The, the students were back, and start, for some reason, why, I don't know, but they charged, started charging forward, charged. hollering and throwing <laughs> stuff. In fact, I could have called a brick bat that came by my head. All right. And, and, and Carl, at this point, Jordan, you were there. I, you I were shot. Think. Yeah, yeah, I was shot, and and, uh, and if you know, I was shot almost in the back. I was shot in the side of the neck, the, the round lodge near my my spine. Um, Were you charging forward I was when not you got charging forward. shot? No, <laughs> no, ma'am. I had stopped, and I, I would venture to say, Carl, some students may have been moving towards you, but when you use the term charge. I cannot imagine, now I, you, you know, I've been in combat, I'm, I'm going to tell you. I would not charge at someone holding a shotgun, and I have nothing but a brick in my hand. It just doesn't register. I can't say that it may not my, have happened. My question was, did you throw the brick? No, sir. Because uh, I could have caught one, one, somebody in that group through it and then uh, whenever that was happening is when I heard more gunshots coming from behind this group. There were, there, Carl, there were no guns. There. I, I, I'm, I, I can tell you unequivocally, there was no one behind me, and I was near, the, not, not, in, not in front. I was not last in the rear, but I think Jack's depiction, uh, the, the graph showed it from the grand jury where I was. I say I was. Um, but I can tell you, no one was... That, that would mean that we would have been caught in the crossfire because the ones from behind would be trying to shoot the cops. And how would they hit the cops at the top of the grass? <clears throat> no, that, would, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to interrupt you here so, because Bill was also there and has not been able to get a word in edgewise yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. What is your recollection? Okay, I was standing down there on the sidewalk at the corner um, of the highway and the exit from the campus. And I was talking with Ellis McDougall, who was the director of the prison system, who was down there. And we heard a small caliber fire, the same as you, you were talking, 22, as a person who knew arms, I would say it was a 25 or 32. It was a small caliber pop, pop type of gun, not a loud report like a 38 or a 357. We heard that around dusk. 
from what we thought was over toward the Claflin side of the campus. A little bit later, that a couple of minutes later, I'm still over on the corner talking to the McDougal, and we are about 10 feet behind the highway patrol line up on the top of the knoll there at the corner. And I remember hearing another pop, just a single pop is all I can remember. And Ellis punched me in the back and said, get down, they're shooting at us. And we hit the ground right behind, we were on the grass right behind the highway patrol line when the highway patrol line fired their volley. Um, and then after that one <clears throat> long volley, I heard an officer shouting, cease fire, cease fire. I didn't order that, cease fire. I could hear. I heard hear, a, there was a whistle but, that blew, if I recall correctly, it seemed like I remember hearing a whistle that preceded the shooting. There was one, there was one, one report from a weapon. I was on the ground at that point. There was one report from a weapon and then an, just a couple of seconds later, everybody else far, fired the rest of the volley. Were you in the line of fire? No, I was on the ground right behind the uh, highway patrol. You were behind the, so there was no was, fire coming at I you. I was about as far as from me to you behind the highway patrol line. We were assembling, you know, protesting peacefully down on the front of the campus, right by 601. And what was happening was, you know, we were yelling at all cars coming by, but it was a peaceful demonstration from what I recall. I had uh, gone down and I was with Tom and Smitty yeah. Yeah. and Bert and his roommate. Now, Smitty was, uh, you know, the one who was one of the ones killed. killed, right? Yes, yes, and now the, the, they had built a fire mm -hmm. in the road. Right. right. So it was a fire down there and I was talking to them and I was sick, uh, feeling bad, went to an infirmary. Three minutes after I left that area, mm -hmm. I heard these explosions. Bloom, bloom, bloom. Mm -hmm. And what is that? I was in the infirmary, and a guy came in and said somebody got shot. And I thought we thought it was firecracker. We thought someone had thrown firecrackers, cherry bombs or something into the fire. And uh, so we started running. We were down in the lobby of the Fay Hall. Oh, okay. And before we could get back to the door, the door, I remember the doors flying open because mm -hmm. you know, they came open this way. And so all these kids running and how the people, because uh, you know, a few didn't go out, but how, how people inside didn't get trampled, I don't know. I was out there by Longman Hall. Mm -hmm. So I low crawled as far as I could down there almost to the uh, cafeteria on my hands and knees and went into uh, my buddy's uh, Nick room, who was the president of the student body. Shortly after I got into the room, my uh, another one of our friends, Jenks, uh, Nathaniel Jenkins came mm -hmm. in and he was said, man, I've been shot. He was shot in the foot. And so myself and Latson and another one of our friends decided we're going to use my car and take Jenks to the hospital. So we drove over to the uh, Orangeburg Regional Hospital at that time. We uh, dropped Jinx off, and Latson went into the hospital with Jinx. Well, while I was in the parking lot waiting for Latson to come back out of the hospital emergency room, uh, a state trooper came up to the car window, pointed a gun, shotgun, in my face, and said, get the F out of here, nigga. But you know the thing that gets me is that I was out there with Smitty, and I was out there with his roommate, Bert. Smitty got killed. Yeah, and that's right. Bert that. got shot five times. Oh, five times. That 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 occasion in Orangeburg, on all of us, has been profound in my life. That night was the first night in my life that 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 I felt invincible. That, 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 that I felt that I could die. Mm -hmm. As we were nearing the completion of the book, uh, Jack Nelson and I saw J.C. Coleman, who was the Deputy Attorney General of South Carolina. He was the defense counsel 
for the highway patrolman at their trial at which they were all acquitted. And I told him, he said, are you writing a book about Orangeburg? And I said, yes. He said, you know what started the shooting? I said, we have a theory. He said, tell me your theory and I'll tell you if you're right. And I said, our theory is one of the patrolmen fired what he intended as a couple of warning shots and that's what start, you know, and, and that's what actually started the shooting. And he said, well, I don't want to talk about it. And then we, we sat down together and we had something to eat and we got to dessert and he looked me in the eye and he said, you know, you're the first person I've heard even suggest that theory except for the patrolman who told me he fired the warning, what he thought were warning shots. When is the resolution of the Orangeburg Massacre story going to take place? What does it take for us to come up <clears throat> with or to have a comprehensive report? We hear that there was a justice report ordered that was never released. We hear that the FBI was charged with investigating, but that they were somehow perhaps complicit in what happened since they were there on the scene and a part of the investigation. So what does it take for us to get a final resolution? Well, to the state of South Carolina, we've already had one. And nobody cares what the FBI in 1968 has to say. I mean, if they issue a report today from 1968, they can go fly a kite, okay? It's the same FBI that told Martin Luther King to go kill himself. So I am not interested in anything the FBI has to say under that Hoover administration from 1968. And I don't think that that would carry much weight today. That's first, but the finality's already been written. It's their story, it's not a real story, but it's theirs. Three kids died, one person went to jail, period. Story over. We lost family members, number one. Um, we lost uh, a part of our legacy. At this point, after 50 years, um, the first 10 years uh, were uh, very confusing and going into the 20th year, um, we had some feelings that maybe uh, someone other than uh, Cleveland Sellers uh, might be brought to justice. But after a period of time, um, we kind of just uh, healed from it because uh, we didn't have any power to change anything after all these years, and uh, not the resources to even do the research to find out what really happened, where it really started. Uh, we have our theories, but that's, that's still a mystery. Uh, and I think uh, going forward, uh, there are always gonna be questions about it, uh, because uh, we still have a void. We're going to always have a void. But it was devastating, to say the least, when they called us and told us that Henry was killed. When the incident took place, someone from the college, I believe, or called my mother, and initially they told her that Henry had been wounded and that, I guess, about a few hours later, they called again and said that he was he had died and he was killed at State College. And her uh, initial reaction was, of course, she collapsed screaming. And it really hurt me and my other two, um, two brothers also. During that time, there was no uh, crisis intervention for us, you know, to say uh, what had happened. I know that for me, I mean, I was a smart student, but I could no longer focus. And it was like I was walking around in a trance. And uh, later, I would learn that not only was I walking around in a trance, but I was having pedimol seizures because I couldn't focus on my, my work. And when I, uh, my parents, uh, influenced me to uh, leave and, 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 and transfer to Payne. I remember sitting in classes at Payne, not being able to focus. I really believe that um, the real fundamental problem 
uh, it comes from society as a whole, uh, not having as much value on the life of those students uh, on that campus uh, as they had on the life of the students at Kent State. We don't know who authorized the shots into the students. We don't know why you have deadly double-eyed buckshots on a, on a college campus. We don't know if there were any guns. In fact, let me rephrase that. There were no guns found amongst the students. You had 40 people out there laying down. You did not find one weapon. So we don't know why that force was used. If you go back to the night of the 6th, anyone will tell you in law enforcement that there's no reason that you use that type of force, the batons, or the batons with the leather rawhide whips at the end that they, that they used to beat the students. And they'll tell you that there was a co-ed who was held by two state troopers while another one beat her. There were nope. more than, more than more one than, co-ed. More, more than one. one. But I'm, I'm just using that instance as an example. You don't use that type of force when you simply have property damage. And so what you had was you had law enforcement that was ill-equipped to handle a protest. You had one scapegoat, and we still don't have the answers to those questions. Now, whether or not we want to answer those questions is vastly different. But the answer that we hear is that my father was the agitator, my father was the scapegoat, and there you have your answer to the question. I'm not blaming the patrolmen so much as the very flawed training they received from, from the FBI. They were told if someone is, how you could just fire right back, that you used, that you used buckshot in the guns to fire. I was going to comment but on what Jack was saying, um, just finished saying about the riot training. Um, for a brief period after I was out of the Army the first time, I was a commander of a unit up in New Jersey, the New Jersey National Guard. Now, this was in 71, 1971. The riots took place in, in the cities he's talking about earlier. In 1971, uh, the training had already been in place for four or five years, which, which preceded uh, what happened in Orangeburg. So the manuals for guard units was already written. But this was not the guard that fired. But the point is the training also was for uh, city and police, uh, city police departments also. I mean, also. to put it plainly, like why, why didn't the police use rubber bullets? I mean, if they're charging them, why didn't they use tear gas? Well, you, you got to look at the history of what's going on all over the country. And you mentioned several of the play, cities in the country had riots and, and they had to use different types of weapons but and whatnot. It, you, from your own statement, you're, you're dispersing a crowd. You use the word charging, that's in dispute. It, I could care less. Sure. Let's say they were charging. So, but, but, I mean, but, 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 the, well, but me, law enforcement... Let me correct you there. I, I, I said they, they were charging, but not, not meaning that they were coming. They were throwing brick bats they and things at us. And, and, and that's, exactly that's when I was standing at the stop of that step. Let when, me ask you, my when, only when question it, to you is well, simply... Well, I heard somebody shoot, but it wasn't from the crowd. It was from behind the crowd in the... In my the, only question <laughs> to you is it's very simple. And you, you've been in law enforcement longer than I have been born. Would rubber bullets or tear gas disperse the crowd equally as effective? No. no. So, you, so, we, so we, the answer to the question, and you still maintain the answer to the question, is to kill Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton. Under, under the circumstances, well, then I don't under even the know why we're having a special. Of what had taken place all <laughs> over the country, Martin Luther King had just been killed. Is that no? no, no Martin no, Luther King was not King killed, killed until April for 4th. two months well, later. Uh, two and, months but, later. Okay, but, have, but you have raised a specter here. Is the crux of this discussion the fact that because there were riots going on elsewhere, the reaction Precisely. to the police of the law enforcement officers, the reaction of the governor in persisting in the outside agitated theory as well as you, the fact that there was a fear that the city of Orangeburg would be overrun and would result in a riot like those that had taken place elsewhere. Is that not the reason there was an overreaction? Well, uh, you might overreaction, but the fact is, r Wednesday night, there were shooting coming from the campus, and we had officers over there where the bullets were hitting above their heads. So there was some shooting going on Wednesday night, and on Thursday night, when we heard that one shot, they re answered the, 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 the shot. Whether the shot was well, a patrolman, as he said, no, who confessed no. to firing. Well, that, 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 that's the first I've heard that. I, I was standing there, and the patrol was standing to my left. I heard the shot come from... from but 
my, my, my question is, was it not that there was an atmosphere prepared for what was deemed to be the eventuality of a riot? Is that not we had a part had one riot on Tuesday of yes. the story? Yes. You had a disturbance, but you didn't have a riot. On Tuesday, we had a riot. That's, that, that yeah. Cleveland Sellers was convicted for inciting to riot. He was, now, he was yeah. given a pardon later, but, but he was convicted by a jury of, 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 of that. Of 10 whites and two blacks. Yeah, I covered, I covered I the trial. What, what the matter? They were citizens of South Carolina. Well, you be black and get a fair trial in 68 or 72. <laughs> and the shooting took place, which was most unfortunate. And we've all said the most regrettable thing we've ever had. Also, it was a very unfortunate, tragic incident. And I'm not sure we'll ever really know what triggered it. I think the state's very culpable mainly because they had, um, the governor made the decision to send state troopers on that campus. And there were other avenues they could have pursued, like closing the campus, sending the students home, uh, tear gas as opposed to shotguns with, that, that they intended, that, that, that you couldn't avoid the damage that a shotgun would do. There were other remedies they could have pursued other than a lineup of state patrolmen firing into a group of students, unarmed students. I mean, I know there are those who want the state to make amends or whatever. I personally don't see that as being enough or as even meaning anything because, I mean, it, I mean, it's just like offering me a cookie. I mean, if you have a tribe over here who has hurt you, and you're another tribe, and they still, they hate, they hate you, and they, they're going to show you that they hate you when they go to the voting booths, um, what good is an apology uh, if your behavior is not going to change? I think Governor Sanford may have offered up some kind of an apology at some point in time. And um, so you apologize to the students, then you go out and you pass laws and approve budgets that underfund the school. Uh, Stockton State has been intentionally underfunded for years. And I'm on the school with that. It has been intentionally underfunded for years. And we all know that. Uh, it's supposed to be on equal with Clemson, uh, how is it uh, that you have a land-grant school that's not classified as a research school when that's the definition of what a land-grant school is all about? I think and feel that the fact that Governor Hodges offered an apology to the families and to the, uh, of the students that were injured or killed in that Orange Bird Massacre the fact that he did that, that speaks volumes to me because I feel the state actually is trying to acknowledge that they are culpable or responsible for some of, of, of the, well, the Orange Bear Massacre period. I want to move on spiritually and I, I think I can do that. Um, even though you, you probably see that I'm still torn inside, but I'm still here, and I'm still thinking that my Lord and Savior can help me through this. I don't think a state <clears throat> legislature can help me with my situation. I think closure is a nice word that people use to describe situations, but when you lose a loved one, I don't care if it's to a tragedy or any way, uh, especially if it's a tragic situation. There is never any closure. There's no, I don't have any anger or hatred, but I don't have any closure because he, he was snatched from us. Do you have closure? I have closure and I've discussed that. I have closure not from the standpoint that, uh, going back to what Jack has talked about and what has happened to Cleveland, but I have closure from the standpoint that I have moved on. I had to move on. 
because if I didn't, I wouldn't be where I am now. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm not sure that we have moved this discussion forward, <laughs> but we have certainly had a discussion. And what we have proved is that what we said at the beginning, the recounting still go on, the accounts are different, but the Orangeburg massacre remains South Carolina's shame and an impetus for our learning more about race relations in our state. Thank you for joining us and good night. Every time it happens today, it's just a reminder of what happened then. I mean, when I see Ferguson, I see Orangeburg. What was shared as a, as a result of the Orangeburg Massacre, I think it should be remembered that we should at least sit down and talk and get these things resolved before it get to that. I've also said that the Orangeburg Massacre will be the litmus test for race in the state of South Carolina. Well, I think this is to properly educate people. That's what I think. I think the state has never made a sufficiently uh, a sustaining commitment to the school. We've responded in spurts. The legacy is not to give up on the fight for social justice, not to, to give up.